Good morning, everybody. We're starting now. Please take your seats. It's with great pleasure that I welcome you all to the 2015 edition of Sharing is Caring, this year under the headline, Right to Remix. Remix culture is happening on the web, in schools and informal learning environments, in fab labs, startups, in creative environments, at hackathons, as artistic practices. It's happening, sorry, is it happening in the cultural heritage sector? Should it? What can we learn from remix culture? Can we benefit from it? Can society at large benefit if we allow remixing of our collections? How can we allow remixing to happen while respecting artists' and authors' rights? Can or should we prevent creative remixing of other people's works? Do people have a right to remix cultural heritage? These are some of the exciting questions and difficult questions that we're going to discuss today. We have a brilliant range of speakers and panelists to take us through the program. And we have you here, an excellent audience of practitioners and experts in the cultural, tech and knowledge sectors. On your seat, you'll find a small publication from my museum, Statens Museum for Kunst. In the spring, we held an event called SMK Friday Set Art Free that focused on all the new things we can do with our collections when they're digitized and opened up for reuse. One of the things we did was invite 12 artists and designers to remix artworks in our collections and exhibit their new works next to the originals. This was a very interesting way to rediscover our collections and the unseen potentials in them. At the same time, such an event raises debate. What are the limits of artistic freedom when it comes to remixing uh, original works? Should collecting institutions support and facilitate such remixing practices and why? On your seats, you'll also find a sheet of paper for evaluation. Before we continue, I'd like you to spend just one minute filling out question number one about your expectations for the seminar. Please go ahead. Great. Before you leave the seminar today, uh, please, repri <laughs> please reply to the remaining questions and just leave your filled out evaluation on the sh uh, seat and then we'll collect them um, after the seminar. Thank you very much. A little bit of housekeeping. The seminar is live streamed on YouTube, um, the Association of Danish Museums channel where it will be available uh, afterwards too. 
If you tweet during the day, please use the hashtag Sheke15 and also write to Remix and hack for DK. I'd like also to encourage you, if you take pictures during the day, to share them on Flickr and preferably with a Creative Commons license so we can share and reuse the pictures and pull them together so we can all go back and re-experience this day together. Also, this is a day where we hope for great debates. When you stand up and say something, please um, raise your hand, wait for a microphone, and then introduce yourself with name and affiliation. This is a great way to create network. So, um, we also take questions and comments on Twitter on the hashtag ShareCare15, so I'll be watching that hashtag during the day. So if you don't feel like standing up, you can also post questions and comments there. Restrooms over here. Wardrobe is uh, at your own risk. Smoking is prohibited inside, so please step outside by the entrance where you'll find ashtrays. So, one thing is talking about Remix, another one is doing it ourselves. Learning by doing has always been the best way to get new experiences. Therefore, we have a task or something fun for you today. We'd like to invite you to Van Go Yourselves. Van Go Yourself is a website that helps you reenact and reinterpret artworks with your friends. Sorry, there's some technical problems. Det var den der opdaterede. Der lå en hel masse mere. Tak. Okay. Sorry about that. So Van Go Yourself is a website that helps you reenact and reinterpret artworks with your friends. It's very simple. You choose an artwork, you get into position, take a picture and upload it to the website, where your reenactment will feature next to the original. We tried it at my museum at SMK Friday, set art free, and had a lot of fun while getting to know our artworks in new ways. We have selected three artworks from Van Gogh Yourself that are easy to reenact. And we've created stations over here in the corner. So during breaks today, we invite you to go over and reenact these artworks. You can do one with yourself, you can do one with friends, you can mix genders and um, be imaginative when you create these reenactments. Make your own interpretations. There are props over there and um, we hope that you'll um, have fun. Um, we have some helpers to uh, get these reenactments going. Uh, Cecilia and Sophia, uh, can you please raise your hands? over here and she's downstairs and also Panele and me please raise your hands so go over to the stations during breaks and try and remix yourselves we'll try at the end of the day to show the resulting pictures on the screen here finally I'd like to thank all the speakers, the keynotes, ignites, and panelists, and our moderator, who will lead us competently through the day. Thank you to all the people who helped organize this seminar, partners at DR, the Association of Danish Museums, and MMX, and also our volunteers. Thank you all for spending the day here with us, uh, also the people who are following online, to learn, discuss, share your insights and ideas, and hopefully be inspired. With this, I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator, Harry Favane, who is Deputy Director of Europeana. Some of you might remember him from last year where he moderated a keynote in conversation, and we all agreed that he did that so brilliantly that we invited him to come and moderate the whole day here this year. 
So we're very happy to have you. With a background as business developer in the publishing industry and advisor on copyright, Harry has worked for the past five years in Europeana to bring cultural heritage out of the vaults of the museums, libraries and archives and into the hands of citizens, teachers, learners, creatives, innovators, hackers, all of us. His knowledge of social business innovation with cultural heritage makes him the perfect capacity to lead us through the day. Please take the stage. Wow, that's quite a, uh, an introduction. <laughs> um, I wanted to start talking about my holiday, really. Um, this year, my family and I, uh, I have two kids. Uh, the youngest is David, he's 11, and the oldest is Nick, he's 13, and my wife, Florine. <clears throat> we want to do something different. Uh, we're saving up for a big trip next year. We want to go to South America or something big, and uh, we wanted to save some money. So we explored a, something new, well, something new to us at least, um, and we explored home exchange. Now, does any one of you ever done a home exchange? Can you just raise your hand? Just, then I know who to contact for home exchange next year. <laughs> <laughs> right. Quite a few people. Um, to be frank, I mean, I don't know how you felt, but uh, it, it scared the hell out of us. The idea that you have people just, you know, complete strangers walking into your home and, uh, you know, all these fantasies about uh, the kids wrecking up the PlayStation and, uh, you know, dad driving drunk in your car and mom perusing through your old love letters and, you know, those type of fantasies. But, um, you know, it was still an appealing idea. So, so we explored it. Uh, we made pictures of our house the way it never looks, but uh, as clean as you could imagine it. <laughs> and everything was nicely tucked away. And, uh, and we entered that matchmaking market. And it was a fascinating exploration, I must tell you. Um, you, know, you you've been through it, some of you. Uh, it's matchmaking, it's like, it's like dating. You, you, you present yourself, you get in touch with other people. <clears throat> and before we knew it, we, had, we were in touch with people from all over the world. Uh, who had their homes at display and who wanted to come to Holland. And we thought ourselves, who would ever want to come to Holland? I mean, seriously. <laughs> I don't know how you Danes feel, but uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty subdued and modest about you know, what we think our country has to offer. You know, summers are not you know, tremendously nice and hot. But, so we were in conversations, and before we knew it, we were in touch with this really nice couple from Sevilla, um, Manuel and Sofia. They had two kids, same age. And, uh, Again, before we knew it, we were booking, we were, we were making arrangements, and there we were, uh, you know, on our way to Sevilla, and those people were in our home. And uh, you probably know where the story is going. Uh, the PlayStation's still there, Dad didn't, Dad didn't wreck the car, and I don't know if uh, Sophia went through my love letters, but to be honest, I don't care anymore, because we had such a nice experience with it. Uh, we were in constant contact via WhatsApp, we were exchanging tips, uh, we met their families, uh, they met our friends, uh, you know, we saved a ton of money, I mean, like, you know, probably uh, up to a thousand or more uh, over a holiday. And it was just a really, really great experience. And to me, that was also, at the time I was already thinking about this conference, and I thought, that that's a very nice analogy for what we're doing here, sharing is caring. And, uh, you know, the way I experienced it there, I think, is something that we can learn from in our industry. I mean, you're all people from the museum sector here, uh, I'm assuming. Um, so we've did some studies at Europeana, and uh, you know, if, you, if you put everything on a big pile, all the stuff that we've done in digitizing cultural heritage, this is pretty much what it looks like. So the, the big pile there, that's all our heritage, all our common memories, basically, uh, as Europeans. And the top bit there, the top 10% is the stuff that we've digitized. You know, over the past 10, 15 years, we've digitized close to 300 million objects. Now, you know, think about that for a second. You know, how much stuff that is. That's incredible. The unfortunate thing is not so much that there's a lot not digitized. I mean, that's also a problem. But what I want to talk to you about today, because this is about the right to remix, is what can you do with that top 10%? Actually do. And we, when you dig into that, it's actually 
quite a scary situation. Of that 10%, only 2% of that 10% is legally reusable, which is explicitly made available for reuse, public domain, etc. We'll, we'll hear much more about that today. So what can we do about them? That's, I think, the, the, one of the big questions that we have. Um, with Europeana, the organization I work for, we try to make much more of that material reusable. So you see that in April 2014, um, that was close before the last time I was here, um, we had about 35% uh, of the material in Europeana reusable. And we made some progress working with all of our museums, libraries and archives, about 3,500. Uh, we've made some progress, so that's good, good news. But if we really want to have an impact, if you want to have an impact as organizations in Denmark and across Europe on all of these areas, on a social and cultural level, on an economic level, uh, you want to make your, uh, your situation more innovative and you're better prepared for the future, there's much more that we need to do. So, to wrap this introduction up, what I want you, you to think about during today is how can you make most impact with the things that you do? What can you learn from the speakers here and from the people around you to maybe have that impact really deep? And to come back to the analogy of home exchange, um, it's not about opening up your door, throwing away the key and not looking back. I mean, that's not how you do a home exchange. And nor should you open up your material just like that, all the things that have been put into your trust. But you need to think about what are the tools, what are the mechanisms to build that trust and really do something interesting with it. So, that was my introduction. Um, because it's about sharing and caring and talking, uh, we're not going to just listen and sit down to people. So once in a while, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And right now, I'm going to ask you to stand up. And if you could just talk to your left-hand neighbor or right-hand neighbor and tell them, you know, what is your expectation for today? Just spend a minute on that. Just get to know them and, you know, what is your expectation? Should we put this here? Yeah. In the screen? <laughs> Shall we try that? I no? think they have to do something else. Ah, there are I'm, plenty of lights, no? Yeah. I'm sorry about this. I mean, I'm, I'm always dismayed when people look to <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so they're going to do something about it now. Yeah. I think the microphone is going to be on. Oh, that's good. Um, so, are you controlling my sound here? Ah, uh, oh yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, that's quite a lively conversation going on. If I could have your attention again, yeah. Wow, that went really well. <laughs> it's almost weekend, I can see that. Okay, excellent. So you know a little bit about each other, you know what you expect from today. Um, I'm expecting a lot from our next keynote, uh, Melissa Terrace. Um, Melissa is 
director of UCL Center of Digital Humanities. That sounds like a very prestigious position, which it is. Uh, what I find really interesting is that she has a background both in classical art history, literature and computer science. I mean, that's the, what they call T-shaped people uh, with broad knowledge and deep knowledge that, uh, that I think can make a real change in this industry. Um, I've gotten to know her uh, over the past, let's say, six months. She really raised to our attention. She wrote a couple of very critical blog posts, uh, which were read extremely widely and which have inspired us at Europeana and I think everywhere else. Uh, you know, are we doing the right thing? I mean, we're spending millions of euros here on digitizing stuff. Are we doing enough of it? So I'd like to introduce to you Melissa Terrace. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to come here today. I'm delighted to speak about the things I was ranting about on my blog post, in the hope I don't offend too many of you. I'm really involved in digitisation. I um, teach digitisation within a library school at UCL. So I'm in the library school there. I have a course on introduction to digitisation. I teach librarians and archivists how to digitise and how to manage digitisation projects. We have a little lab here that we have filled to the gunnels with different digitisation technologies, 2D and 3D and multispectral imaging. We do little digitisation projects within our own college, with the libraries, with the archives, with the museums within college. For example, the Medieval Manuscripts Project, which we put online. And I do advanced imaging as my core research area. So advanced digitisation. Here I am taking some multispectral images of an Egyptian mummy. But aside from taking and capturing and making digitised content, the flip side of that is how are people using it? And I see this as two sides of the same coin. If you're interested in making digitised content, you should be interested in why and how people are using it. Otherwise, why are you making the digitised content in the first place? So what I'm here today is to talk about a particular slant of that research I've been doing over the past year. And it all started at a conference like this. I turned up to Digital Humanities 2014 and my colleague Quinn, someone from the Digital Humanities community, had made her own wardrobe. Not just one shirt, but her complete wardrobe. Not for anything special. These are the clothes she wears every day. But she has taken images from cultural and heritage institutions, made fabric, and then she makes it into things that she wants to wear. It turns out that this is quite easy to do now. There are online tools, things like Spoonflower, other sites do exist, where you can design fabric, you can upload the patterns, and you can sell it. You can operate as a little shop where you allow people to buy your patterned material. And this is Quinn's shop, and she has taken various public domain images and turned them into fabric, which she prints, but also allows other people to print off too. So I started to grub around in Spoonflower, having a look at how images particularly of famous artworks have been used. So here we have The Lady of Shalott by Waterhouse, a painting which is in the Tate in London, and it's been turned into this lovely wild pattern. And you can just see a nice tea dress with this on it. It's been interesting to me then to look at what people are saying when they put things online about where they got the images. So for this one, they say, oh yeah, this is free. It was on Wikipedia, so it's free. If you go over to the Tate website and have a look there, you would have to license that painting to get, or images of that painting, to be able to reuse it. And it turns out that Spoonflower and all the other fabric websites are massive copyright infringements. If you want to get fabric printed with Monet's water lilies on it, ta-da! And you can also see differences in the quality of imaging and the images that they've been using to make these fabric swatches. People then remix that. Here we have, obviously, Parliament at Sunset by Monet with the Doctor Who TARDIS mixed in too, which I'm sure you will agree is an obvious juxtaposition. Um, so people are having fun with that and introducing and playing with cultural heritage images without permission from the places that host them in the first place. That's the first thing I want to say. If you're not going to make your stuff available, people are taking it and doing things with it anyway. And there's pretty much nothing you can do about it. The law for copyright is, well, Spoonflower is an American site, so you would have to get involved with you. S copyright law to be able to have take down notices of all this stuff. It becomes very complicated and people are doing this anyway. 
Even estates such as the Andy Warhol estate, which are notorious for going after people that are making money from his prints, other people that are just remixing them for free, no, but people that are making money. If you want fabric with Andy Warhol art on it, it's all up there on Spoonflower. I became really interested in what people were doing with images and high resolution images of art. This is just one or kind of slideshow of, of the things that people are doing with Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. Look, you can get your socks or your cushions or a nice lycra dress made from it. All the things you want to do. And it turns out that there are not one but two suppliers of corsets who make corsets based on the Garden of Earthly Delights. And it turns out that this is another whole subgenre on Etsy where if you want to buy a corset, it with images of historical art in it, they're all there. Look at that. And where did they get these images? They never say. And are these images in the public domain? For the most part, no. So we've got a problem here. Now, there are people who are using stuff in the public domain and using it and remixing it and selling it. So this is someone called Dina Malkova who has a shop on Etsy called Lewis Bowties. And they're all based on um, Lewis Carroll's original manuscript for Alice in Wonderland in the British Library. So the original manuscript has lots of these hand-drawn illustrations, so he drew them himself, and she has taken the patterns of the leaves here and turned that into a fabric print, and she is selling high-quality silk bow ties based on these, and she has a whole range based on public domains. It's a proper shop. It's starting to actually be the kind of things that we might want to support as an institution, as a small business, which has gone from a kitchen table to producing stuff which is actually creating revenue and all the kind of things that we are told we should be doing. So there are people that are using it, taking public domain stuff and building businesses upon it. What can we be doing to support that even more? So, in response to that and seeing people doing this, I kind of thought, whoa, that's really interesting, isn't it? And I thought, you know, there's one thing to be looking at all that stuff and going, fascinating, fascinating, the Doctor Who tired us with the money paintings, oh, how interesting. And it's another thing to actually go, I'm going to make something. I'm going to choose something in a library archive museum that has been digitised, and I'm going to make something. And it has to be something that I love, so I have to find something first. I have to get the permission to use it, and I have to make something that I really want that I will actually use. And so the next 10 minutes is the story of what happened next. So the first thing is, if you decide as a user to go, and this is something that I teach digitization, so I teach people how to do it properly, but now I'm the user, I'm trying to use this stuff. You are confronted by lots of content management system websites. Most libraries, archives, museums, they haven't built the systems themselves, they're outsourcing them to other places, they're buying access to databases. And it turns out, from a user, that these databases are horrific to use, particularly if you don't know what you want to look for. So if you imagine internet shopping, usually you have to say, what are you going to get? You have to imagine it, you know the words to type in, you type in the words, the thing pops up. But if you're just looking for something which is physically very interesting, or it's an image which is creative, there's no way at the moment to browse through content to find stuff which is visually interesting. Yet we are spending millions and millions and millions of euros and pounds and krona to make digitised images of stuff, and we're not allowing people to search them as if they were interesting imagery. There's something wrong there. That's not the fault of museums, libraries, archives. That's the fault of the people building the content management systems. I'm going to pick on one in particular. Has anyone ever tried to use Aqua Browser? Whew. Do you know, as a user, trying to go through this and trying to find anything unless you really know what you're trying to get, it's impossible. I'm going to pick on Flickr as well. If you put up lots of stuff in Flickr and don't to, uh, put it into little sets, it's incredibly difficult for users to scroll through thousands and thousands and thousands of images to find anything. Europeana has um, lots of resources up there, but it can be incredibly di difficult to find things which are interesting from a design perspective, and then it's difficult to know what you can do with things after. They have improved that greatly over the past year after my ranty blog post, um, where they say at the side, um, yes, can I use it? Yes, with attribution, only with permission. So they give some indication as to if you can do things at the same time, but my reaction really is there is so much stuff available now and such poor interfaces. So much stuff, such poor interfaces. So it kind of left me like this. 
I spent about two or three months trying to find something from a library or archive or museum that I wanted to use. And I was like, James, I'm teaching this stuff and to how to put all this stuff online. And actually, as a user trying to find something that I really like, you know, it's incredibly difficult. It turns out that there are people experimenting with interfaces. This is Two Way Street by Good Hope and Spectacle. So they, this is the British Museum collection. They've just taken the whole thing. And they're, they're experimenting with the interface to allow people to browse it differently. So people are starting to experiment with interfaces. And we now have to have a conversation about whether it's enough to create things or whether we should also be curating them. And I know that we all hate the word curate to mean actually just making a folder full of stuff, right? But actually, it's about having a huge collection and saying, these 10 or 15 things might be really interesting to people who want to go and remix them and to make fabric or to make things or to make products. Helping people out, helping people sort through the haystack to find the needle. And there has been a shift in how we um, d deliver digital collections over the past few years and an understanding that we need to do a lot more curating than just creating and putting it out there. There are movements towards that. Europeana is doing a lot of good in that place. There's the Easy Wins, there's Pinterest, there's Tumblr, uh, but there's also making data sets available and describing to people what they actually are. So there are easy things people can do once they understand the nature of that problem. There are also collections such as, this is um, from the National Archives in the UK, and they've put together a collection of uh, wallpaper and fabric prints um, over a period of time, which design schools can subscribe to, to see patterns for things. But this is a subscription service. It does cost quite a lot of money. And if you choose images, you then have to license them again. So there's a lot of money involved in this. And the interesting thing from this, the design collection, it's the things on there stop at 1919. Why would that stop at 1919? Why are the images they are making stopping at 1919? Any ideas? Copyright. Can you say that a little bit louder? <laughs> copyright. Oh, goodness. So, copyright, it turns out, means, and I'm going to pick on the British Library here, which is a shame. I love the British Library. I work very closely with them. They've put up these million images on Flickr. This is all great, and it's brilliant, and I love it. But they're all from Victorian books, so there's an aesthetic to that. And if you're into steampunk, yay, that's great. I'm not, though, right? <laughs> So you have all these kind of Victorian images, and if you want to take them and do something with them, yay! And I spent, you know, a kind of month scrolling through all the stuff, trying to find the thing that I wanted to have discovered. And I've, I'm just not into that aesthetic, like fundamentally. And that was the rule. I had to find something I loved and I liked and I wanted to do something with. So there we go. Copyright has kiboshed that. And I understand why, but at the same time, it's putting lots of restrictions on what we can make available. Um, I look up here, this is looking up corset in Europeana, and copyright also makes people scared. So here we have, in Europeana, we have 720 images of corsets in Europeana, and at the bottom there, public domain mark, can I use it? There's only 18 of those that people have said, you know what, do what you like with it. The rest of them, yeah, permission, um, uh, can use with restrictions. Whatever, you have to write to the institution, get permission to do things. But you go, you know what, how many of these institutions are really going to find the time and energy to do something with this stuff? Is it really that precious? I understand if you've got a Chaucer manuscript or a Shakespeare folio and all the stuff you can spin off to the newspapers to make money. But actually, from an institutional perspective, why are people so scared about giving people access to this stuff? And what do they think they're keeping? There's an interesting discussion to be had there. What do they think they're keeping? And this isn't Europeana's fault. This is the institutions who are assigning the licenses. And so there has a talk to be had there about why would we make it open and what are you scared of if it is made open? Because people are taking it anyway, right? People are taking the stuff and doing what they like with it anyway. And you will not have the resources to chase up the copyright infringements. You will not have the legal resources to chase it. Another thing I discovered is that people put up really bad images. They say they're open, they say they're free to be used, and you couldn't use them because they're cropped right in half. 
Thanks for that. So this is the Internet Archive book images, and that's to do with the algorithm which they went through the books and they cropped them all. But a lot of them are sliced off, a lot of them are cut through, you just can't use them. So for images, for people to do anything creative with them, they need to be, first of all, at least 300 DPI, at least. And then you can't compress them until they're ruined, and then you need to put some white space around them and keep white space so people can actually do stuff. If you're cropping them too closely, if you're putting 72 dots per inch JPEG, I'm getting a bit technical here, but if you're putting 72 dots per inch JPEG up on the website, people can do nothing with them. If you really want people to take this stuff and run with it, give them the files. That has issues with bandwidth and issues with how much information you're putting up there and delivering, but seriously, it's an issue from the maker community about quality. The other thing I want to talk about is time. There is a perception that we're doing people a huge favour by putting this stuff online, and it takes a lot of time and resources to do so. To digitise, to put it up on the CMS, to deliver, to publicise, to choose all these things. We've looked after something in an institution for two, three hundred years, we're finally making it available digital. You know, there's an aspect of time and care and everything. But there's also an aspect of time and care from the maker community. It struck me how difficult it was, firstly, to find things I wanted to reuse and to get the licensing for things. It takes people time to do that. It takes people a lot of time to take that image of the Alice in Wonderland manuscript and turn it into a really high quality item which they can retail in shops. That takes a lot of time and a lot of development. So it's about respect for the maker community too. The thing that we all have a shortage of is time. We have a lot of digital content. None of us have much time, and we have to be respectful on both sides as to what it means to actually make things. How much time have we got left? We're sorry. Ten minutes, okay. So I'm going to quickly run through what I did then. So I had all these difficulties, and eventually I found a picture, and ironically, I found it in a print catalogue. I didn't find it online at all. So I'm, I'm involved with the National Library of Scotland, I'm on the Board of Trustees now, um, and they gave me a stack of old catalogues of exhibitions to kind of, this is our business, this is what we do. And I was flicking through, like, oh, I better have a look at these, you know, and I came across this image here. It's lolly time, a lolly image. Isn't that lovely? It's um, an advert that used to be put on in between children's films in the 19th 50s in a cinema in Glasgow called Eglinton Toll, and it's lolly time, it's when people used to go and get their lollies, their ice creams. Um, the firm that made this went bust in the 1960s, it's an orphan work, we don't know who the illustrator was, it was digitised already, so the National Library of Scotland licensed it to me for £10, so I could do whatever I liked with it and not sell it, and I could put it on my website. So that was all happy, I found something. And then you go through the kind of maker process, so it was... A, uh, it's a, a slide, a glass slide, so it was a bit dirty, you had to clean up the photograph, you then get this lovely kind of cleaned up version, and ta-da, I turned it into a lovely silk scarf, which I've got with me today in my bag, I wear it all the time, I love it, there I am, woo, with my silk scarf. Um, I wear it when I go up to board meetings at the National Library like this, oh, here I am, with my, your content around my neck. Um, so, you know, it's a really kind of nice thing to kind of do, but it took me a lot of time to get there. It took me a, all the finding of stuff, and then the making took about 20 hours, and then it, that cost about £100 to print it off. So it's, you know, it's an investment in things, and I made this one thing. And then, for the last five minutes, I'm going to talk about what happens when people go, that's a nice scarf, where can I buy one? So then we have an issue, I've licensed this image so I can do what I like with it without selling it. And I think, oh, what will I do to buy it? How will I get permission to use it if it's an orphan work? And it turns out there's a whole EU framework about orphan works, things in the 20th century, and how you can license them and register them to get permission to do things like set up an Etsy shop where I'm based this whole thing on illustrations from 1950s cinemas in Scotland. You know, I could do that, but I would have to be able to get the license for these things. And about a year ago, the UK government had re released their intellectual property guidance on orphan works, and this is where it all gets a bit technical and boring. Firstly, you've got to do a diligent search, which means you have to try and track down anyone that might own the copyright of this, and there's pages and pages and pages and pages of where you have to ask and write to. Does anyone remember who this illustrator was? No. Has anyone got any records of who the manager was in 1952 of this cinema in Glasgow? No. So, you know, it becomes this huge 
huge issue on a huge amount of time. And then you have this online system which asks you to fill out all these things to generate the licensing cost to be able to use it. And it turns out that lantern glass slides from cinemas don't fit into any of these things in the first place. And then you get to the thing where it goes, is this use work primarily intended for monetary compensation? And you go, you know what, I'm not in Kansas now. This is going to go horribly wrong any minute if I'm going to say, yes, I'm a commercial business. Because it turns out that they think if you want to make money off it, you must be Walmart or Gap, and you must want to make more than a million items. <laughs> Seriously, I was thinking about printing up 10. That would have cost me 300 pounds. I might have, you know, if I sell them for 50 pounds each, then I could have made 20 quid of each one. I mean, that's, that's the kind of kitchen table thing I was starting to think of. Not a million, and the, the smallest amount is 5,000 that you can do. <laughs> so then you go, right, tell me, how much is it going to be to license? So I can, pr not, I can print off 5,000 scarves. Guess, come on, let's guess. Anyone who hasn't read my blog post, how much are they going to charge me for a license? How much, you said? 10,000. 2,659 pounds for the license. <sighs> the government get the money, and then if someone comes along within seven years and says, I drew that, I'm, I'm drew that, that copyright belongs to me, then they pay out. And if after seven years, the money hasn't been claimed, then they say that the money will go back into the culture and heritage sector. And I said to them, but seven years, that's two governments away. <laughs> what proof can you give me that it will indeed go back into the culture and heritage sector or that there will be a culture and heritage sector? Um, I, and so that didn't go down well. And it was a little bit unfortunate because um, I, I kind of I started to I live blog this. I thought it would be fun and easy. And I thought it would be, yeah. And so, well, yeah, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And I thought it would be like fun. And in the end, it turned into another ranty blog post. And they didn't know this was coming. And it started to be this big public fight. And sorry, IPO. I didn't really realize I was going so public at the time. Anyway, um, in the end, I licensed it for my own use. And it cost 10 pence to license it for your own use, which means I could put the files up on my website and tell you where to go and get it printed, but I cannot print the thing up for you and charge you money for it. <laughs> the whole thing's crazy. There's my license. It took me six months to get it. Cost me 10 pence plus 10 pounds processing charge. <laughs> so after a year of this orphan license scheme, how many, how many things are orphan in, in collections? I mean, the National Library of Scotland alone has over a million orphan works, right? Across the sector, there are millions and millions and millions of orphan works. After a year, the whole of the UK had only applied for 287 licenses. That's how successful the scheme is. And it's problematic with how it relates to the, the um, EU scheme. And there I am, there's my license. I can give you that high resolution image today, should you want it. But I can't have to turn a blind eye with what you do with it. You can, I can give it away, but I can't ask. Never mind. This is all documented on my blog if you want to have a read through about the ins and outs and what it all actually means. The interesting thing about this is I got an email last week to say that they're finally taking on board what I was saying about 5,000 items and they're going to reduce the smallest number that you can print off to 500. Do you know what? When you write ranty blog posts, you don't think you're going to change government legislation for copyright. Ta-da! There you go! Impact! Impact, my friends. But this left me like that, because, you know, create content, they said. It will be fun, they said. And instead, I went down this rabbit hole of, like, UK copyright legislation. How many users are going to be as OCD about that as I am? How many users are going to go, oh, I'll get a good blog post about that, that'll be of interest. Perhaps a research paper, you know? So it's that kind of thing. It's, it's, the whole thing is a bit of a mess. But also there are issues then for institutions to be dealing with this stuff because it's not just about digitizing things, it's this whole framework you have to engage with. And I know the next speaker is going to be talking about the tools you can use to engage with that very difficult framework. And it is complicated and it is time consuming and there are choices to be made which we have to grapple with, which are not fun but are necessary at this space and time. I want to go back to the create or curate thing. It is really important that we are pointing people to good resources. We're over the scan and dump stuff. We're over the digitizing millions of things and putting it online. It is now time to point to the good things for different things. And if we choose, we want to support the maker community, we should be curating some really nice things that they can take and make with. 
we need to be curating things and to be pointing people to the good stuff or else they just won't find it. What about me? I'm currently working on another fabric design. This is some notepads I picked up in Inner Mongolia in 2000 from a little old shop. What are the chances I'm going to be able to find the illustrator of those? None. So um, you kind of just go, well, I just need to kind of run with that and be aware that I am now technically breaking the law when I'm going to make a scarf with a little angry Bambi on it. Look, angry Bambi, isn't he lovely? Um, and that's the choices that people have to make. Is it worth the bother with engaging in that? Maybe institutions can be helping them over that hurdle and saying it isn't a bother because we're providing the framework for you. I really think that we are providing access to culture and heritage. We've got a little door that we're letting people into our digital collections. The user might not fit through that door. What they expect behind the door might not be there. It might be a crazy world that they don't know how to engage with. But we've got to try and get over these hurdles, allow people to take stuff, to make stuff, and not so much the law breaking. Thank you very much. Wow, that was amazing. Does that sound familiar to you?